Cameron, it's good to see you again. It's been uh, it's been about a month since we last talked on the uh, very noisy sidelines of of inbound. I kind of wanted to pick up where we had left off in our in our previous conversation because I think it, we were really kind of rolling and 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 some of it got cut off. So I'm I'm glad we're able to to chat today. Um, before we kind of dive into some of those things, I, I kind of wanted to get your feeling on on how the conference was. It's been about a month. We've been able to catch up on sleep. What were your takeaways and and experiences there? First and foremost is that revenue operations is not just a trendy word for a cool role. Um, It's actually a career path that people can get really passionate about. And one of the things that had surprised me is I come from a sales background. And revenue operations for me was just a very natural attraction. I was very surprised at the wide variety of backgrounds of people that had been coming into revenue operations as a role. Um, I I love what I do. And it's really, really awesome to see how many other people, whether they had been in marketing or CS or weren't even in tech uh, before getting into revenue operations, but really just found that they loved strategy. Um, and just the the wide variety of people that had, you know, really started to pick up on this career path to me is really amazing. Um, and then along with that is the growth of the community. So, you know, we talked a little bit about Sprocketeer in the past, and it's really amazing to see how many people not just are doing this as a job, but how many people are really passionate about helping their businesses to grow and develop and are willing to help one another, uh, whether they have questions or if they see someone else that has questions, whether it's communities like Rev Genius or Sprocketeer. um, It's just really, really cool to see everybody come together and help uh, help both grow individually and as a career. Yeah, that was a big takeaway of mine as well. Um, I was really kind of struck by the community aspect of of everything that was going on. And, and, you know, I think it may have been the first kind of in-person big event, industry event I've been to since you know, the before time, as I call it. I participated in inbound, but it was a virtual inbound. So it really was not the same. It was a whirlwind week for us. You know, we we had like a pretty big team up there. We got there on Monday and left on Friday. And it was just a, you know, nonstop as I'm sure it was similar for you. Um, Kind of kicking off on on the community and collaboration and, and where that fits with RevOps. I was struck by kind of the, the palpable sense of community and connection at inbound. So how do you perceive the role of community in driving innovation and progress within the RevOps role? And how does that contra- contrast to, and I think this kind of dovetails with RevOps's kind of um, ethos more generally, but how does that dovetail or contrast with the more isolated kind of siloed approach of, of the past? Yeah, so, and I'm going to praise HubSpot for a moment here, but HubSpot was built on community. Um, Mm -hmm. It's one of the things that helped them to really gain a foothold in the space and to grow and pivot as rapidly as they have. Um, You know, they're not an all on one platform, they're the all in one platform. And so, or backwards, right? They're not the all in one, they're the all on one, right? So um, HubSpot itself isn't gonna do anything and everything natively, but where they're not doing something they have partners and applications that do. Revenue operations as a role and as a career works really well and has grown really well in tandem with the ethos that HubSpot has, right? So HubSpot as a platform enables professionals like us to help businesses grow and develop. And because that's built into the way they operate, um, it's allowed our career path and the role to grow. Um, Now, one of the common things that not only you and I discuss, but uh, one of the common conversations that I've had with numerous people at Inbound and since Inbound is that for the longest time, revenue operations hasn't really had a standardized definition of what the role even was. If you ask 100 different people, what do you do? You're going to get everything from I align sales, CS, and marketing to I help my business make more money to I'm a consultant, right? And so having a community that's able to work together to standardize what is our role? What is the definition of what we do on a day-to-day? How do we approach the same problem across multiple businesses? How can we 
not standardize things, but how can we make things more efficient when we're seeing the same problems? So having that community that's coming together and asking questions helps to remove the silos of, I'm a sales ops specialist, I'm a rev ops specialist, I'm a marketing ops pro, and it helps us all to come together and solve these common trends because at the end of the day, most problems that businesses are facing can be solved in a similar manner. And the approach is going to be different, um, but the track to get to the solution is oftentimes very similar. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, this idea of the approach to, you know, what is RevOps, right? I think we talked about how, you know, before I started uh, one of my previous roles, which was kind of my first foray into this world, I had to literally Google the term, you know, the question, what is RevOps? Um, and in the years since, I don't think there really is still a, you know, solid definition. Um, I think it, 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 you know, a lot of, it's just a glorified sales ops or just a CRM manager in a lot of ways, and not this more strategic uh, position, right? I think that is, there's a need, you know, there's a desire to help advocate for the role of RevOps to have a seat at the table and strategic, strategic decision-making rather than just kind of being another cog in the wheel. I would just add to that, that if you Google, as many of us do when we first start, what is revenue operations? And you look at the answers that pop up, the answers that pop up are the definitions that are written by SaaS companies selling RevOps services. <laughs> Salesforce, it's HubSpot, it's SaaS Academy, right? Chili Piper. Um, which is not inherently a bad thing, but it's not, these definitions are not written by RevOps pros at RevOps companies and RevOps organizations. Um, you know, they're written by companies that are selling SaaS and RevOps services. So that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it doesn't help us get to where we need to be of getting that standard definition. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure we're, we're ever going to get a standard definition um, about anything. And that's the inherent challenge of, of Google and, you know, whoever has the best SEO wins on defining things. Um, but uh, who knows, maybe that will change soon. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think kind of touching on that on RevOps rather than definition, but the ethos, I think the ethos is something that we kind of all agree on, which is about this idea of breaking down silos, whereas before, you know, the go-to-market was kind of very rigidly siloed between, you know, certain departments and RevOps as kind of a um, ethos was about kind of connecting all of those things together and, and breaking down those, those, um, those silos. So, um, you know, how do you think that has been, um, you know, kind of implemented um, and embraced in some of the growing and newer companies that were that we were, you know, we were kind of seeing at inbound that are kind of entering the HubSpot ecosystem from more traditional ecosystems. You know, are you, is it, is it something that those kind of companies and, and clients that you're working with, that they're already coming to the table with that mindset, or is it uh, an uphill battle to get them on board? It absolutely depends on both the company and who's leading it. I liken our role to that of the director of a movie. Um, the director isn't always the one that's making every single casting and hiring decision. So they can't always pick every single talent that's a part of the movie and they can't make talent better per se. Sometimes a director is working with the individuals in that role, right? But their job is to bring alignment with who they have and what they have. And so to that end, some of our clients and partners and same goes for some of the people that I spoke with, it is very much an uphill battle. Um, they're justifying their role every day. They're justifying decisions. You know, they say, hey, I created this report that says our sales efficiency is off. Here is why. And here's how I can fix it. And the director of sales doesn't want to hear it because it makes them look bad. And at the end of the day, our job is not to make up numbers, it's to make a business more efficient. It is, you know, a byproduct of what we do is to bring an alignment across sales, CS, marketing. And not every stakeholder is always going to love every piece of information that's presented to them. So sometimes it is very much an uphill battle. Um, the flip side is I do have quite a few partners and clients that I work with where they recognize my business has problems. 
I know that I don't have all the solutions to it. So I'm putting a lot of faith and trust in you to bring us those solutions. Where things go very well is when we set good expectations, both myself, other revenue operations professionals, right? You set good expectations and they're happy with the service. Um, if you don't set good expectations, then you're always going to be justifying your seat at the table. You know, you say a project or um, an, an ethic as we call it, right? But um, a solution is going to take four weeks and it ends up taking eight now you have to justify the extended time. If you say it's going to take eight weeks and it takes six, now they're very happy with what you've done. So um, I, I think there's an element of doing your job well that comes into play, but just having different personas and being able to work with the ones that are going to make you justify your seat at the table, it's a part of the role. And it's just something that you know you should be prepared for. Yeah. Yeah, that, definitely true. I wanted to dive into this idea of, I think for me, there was a very obvious sense of us being on the in the middle of a kind of generational shift that they re, everybody kind of understood that nothing is going to be the same, whether it's due to uh, technologies like AI and machine learning or just generally kind of the way businesses are approaching things is, is from a go to market is is shifting and people are kind of stepping outside kind of the traditional understanding of what is a sales motion and a handoff and it, it, so from your perspective cuz you know you work with companies that are onboarding to to HubSpot and or implementing new solutions have the use cases and kind of things that people are trying to implement have have those shifted and, and it, what are some of the kind of new and interesting ways and solutions people are looking to implement um, that you're seeing? Yeah, so interestingly enough, AI is a hot topic that everyone likes to talk about, but it's not something that we've seen partners proactively requesting an approach around. And so what I mean by that is, you know, it is something that makes our role as a revenue operations professional a lot easier in some regards because we can go into chat GPT, for example, or chat spot and ask it to interpret a report or um, come up with sales stages for a specific industry. Right. So it's something that can help us because if we ask a partner something and they don't know the answer to it, now we have another resource that we can reach out to. Um, I will say that it is still very much supplementary to, again, just being able to do your role well. I still use it secondary to reaching out to other people for questions and answers. So I like having a human element. Even if I go into chat GPT, I'm still likely to run it, uh, run something by another human if I have a question. But it hasn't um, replaced any of our role at all. Um, if anything, it's made it a lot easier. And partners, I don't think they understand the full depth that AI can bring to the table for them yet, which we might be around the corner from there. But an example would be during uh, Yamini's keynote when she was talking about rolling out ChatSpot and having a live chat AI on a website. You know, that's not something that we've seen requested by partners. Um, and in fact, oftentimes when we suggest something like that, it's waylaid by other priorities. So I think that even though AI is becoming more and more prevalent and it's becoming more normal, so to speak, um, for most partners that aren't in the tech world, so to speak, on a day to day, they're not in revenue operations on a day to day. They still see other priorities like sales motions or marketing motions rather than how can we use AI to enable the customer experience. Which again, that may start to shift, but I don't think we're quite there yet. Yeah, and and with regards to you know sales motions, let's say in particular, you know there was for the longest time it was kind of in, in B two B the sales motion was well understood and you know repeatable, and you know there was kind of the inbound motion, there was the outbound motion, it was you know mostly kind of sales led. You know there was a huge shift for a while where everyone was like, you need to do PLG, you need to, and it was again one of those terms that wasn't super well defined and still isn't. One of the things I've noticed as uh, let's say the macroeconomic situation has shifted that there's been a rebound and a lot of those companies that needed to go that decided they were going all in on PLG have pulled back a little bit and realized that that may not be the best solution. Are you seeing any of that happening, you know, manifesting itself in in your day to day? Are you seeing companies 
kind of trying to figure out how they, you know, what is their their sales motion and shifting that around? Or did, did that kind of not impact your, you know, the the companies you work with? So interestingly, there's an 80% chance that if I ask a business, what are your sales motions? They don't know the answer, which is not a bad thing about the partner necessarily. It just means that I think they they haven't sat down to really think about okay, revenue operations, sales motions, PLG, SLG, right? How like they they are thinking about how do we make more revenue? How do we sell more stuff, right? Um, how do we improve our marketing or our ad spend? And so um, when we take a step back and say, okay, what are your sales motions or what is your sales process? Even sometimes very basic questions, they don't necessarily have an answer to them. The The good news for us is that that's part of our role. And my role is to help define and understand that. And so it's not even that they necessarily don't know their business, but maybe they don't know the terms or maybe they um, just haven't sat down and had those conversations. So things haven't necessarily changed in my time in revenue operations in that regard. Um, I would certainly love for a business to sit down and say, this is our business model, you know, plug it into chat. This is what we do on a day-to-day. What's our sales motion? That would be, that would be very cool. Um, but I think that it allows us to simply add more value from a revenue operations perspective to say, okay, tell me about your business. And then if they don't know the answers to the questions that we have, now we can at least present them to that individual or to those stakeholders. Yeah, I think it's the, the us marketers and talking about myself kind of come up with these terms and then just kind of use them to death and people don't really know what they're talking about you know uh, product led growth was you know used to basically be you know if you had a free trial that was in essence a, a product led growth movement and now it's like you know there's all this other stuff but yeah you know i think i think that's actually a good thing right if people don't get they don't in their mind have a fixed idea of like no no we're a sales led growth company we can't even consider these other things i think it actually is better because if the last 3 4 years has taught us anything is that uh nothing is nothing can be counted on to go on forever everything's changing all the time and you know you have to kind of roll with the punches and you have to adjust it's the companies that kind of adjust and can deal with the changing environment that are going to do well and i think that part of having the infrastructure to be able to adjust to the changing uh, requirements is, is having someone in a revenue operations role that can kind of manage um, manage the back end of that. So shifting a little bit and kind of talking, going back into a uh, community a little bit, and, you know, we, we only touched on it briefly, but it's there in the background of your, your, uh, your, your camera there. And it was all over everything in, in at HubSpot. And so, you know, you talked a little bit about the Hubolution, Hubolution, excuse me, the Hubolution movement, the hashtag. You know, we touched on it. Uh, it, it really kind of embodies this blend of community technology and, and human touch. But uh, you know, I'd love to hear a little bit more about how it came to be. I looked up its definition online um, and found it, but I would love to hear it from you. And you know, what are your thoughts on the movement and its expansion and how it's influencing the RevOps space and the HubSpot ecosystem? And I just love to hear more about it. Yeah, well, so I'm I'm clearly big on definitions and standardizations, right? Um, yeah. As someone that loves strategy, being able to take something and then do it again and again, it's really important to me. When we talk about the Hubolution, the definition is the movement from antiquated CRMs over to HubSpot. Obviously, a very specific definition, something that was created by the revenue operations community. The term was coined by someone at Rev Partners. But the the definition had been created by the revenue operations community as a means of saying, really effectively, we don't want to be confined by one CRM. And and that's not even just Salesforce, right? But we don't want to be confined by one CRM. We don't want to be confined by one tool set. Um, We want to be able to grow revenue operations. And we want to be able to enable revenue operations. Now, HubSpot happens to be very good at enabling RevOps sales ops, marketing ops, revenue operations, because of the fact that it's so user-friendly. And so one of the really great things about the Hubolution, again, the movement from older CRMs, more difficult to use CRMs over to easier to use ones, um, is that HubSpot is just easy to use. And so I have partners very regularly where there are stakeholders that aren't technologically savvy, 
maybe they're in a physical space, like they're selling granite countertops, they're selling, um, you know, physical services or products, and that's their bread and butter. And they're just now in 2023 saying, no, hey, I need a CRM and I need to bring my business online. And so the Hubvolution is taking any business, enabling them to succeed with their CRM and with technology, and then using revenue operations to achieve that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so I did look up the definition and there was a specific mention of the, the antiquated systems by, by name, which I'm glad we left out uh, for, you know, political correctness reasons. Um, but yeah, you know, it, it, it's this idea, that, you know, the, the actual movement, you know, itself, you know, you have a picture of a, a cresting wave there. Uh, you know, what is that imagery? What, how is that representative of, of the movement? I, I, I can guess, but I'd love to hear the idea behind it. Yeah, well, so we we call it the orange wave, again, just the mass migration into HubSpot, which, you know, one more component of this is that HubSpot, as I'm sure you know, started as a marketing platform, really great, robust marketing platform. And to be fair and to play devil's advocate, it evolved into a sales platform and then again an all-in-one or all-on-one platform where now it does sales it does marketing and it does rev ops and you know there's ops hub all, all the cms customer right? success exactly yeah. and so not only did it then start pivoting into all that but then it started to pivot into an enterprise platform and so the orange wave is the fact that HubSpot is not just for small businesses or medium businesses. It's really for everybody. And it, it and, uh, the byproduct of that is that it's easy to use and that there's a community that enables everybody to use it. So the cresting wave just represents the fact that now we have this mass migration at all levels onto the HubSpot platform. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of the, the imagery is, is really well done. And for all those who are listening and not watching, it has a very kind of Japanese art vibe to it which i probably you know I, i'm sure there's a name for that kind of uh art but uh, um, i didn't do so well in art history but yeah you know i think the the kind of uh you you all had your own area in the hallways of inbound where you just had kind of constant movement and excitement around this and it was very exciting to see so uh you know shifting gears again you know along with this hubolution movement where you're seeing people kind of moving into the ecosystem it does seem especially Leading up to and after inbound, that HubSpot itself is adapting to this changing user base or the you know more diverse use cases, uh, and really kind of rolling out new features and and aspects of the platform to support it. And I've seen a lot of this recently, and I've seen people kind of refer to that shift of the platform in the same terms as you know Hubolution. So you know, maybe you can speak a little bit to that if you know you're see, if you think though you know it's a cause and effect and some of the you know how you see that shift enabling people in RevOps roles to succeed more within uh the HubSpot platform. Yeah, so everybody knows everybody likes to buy nobody likes to be sold. And people want their role to be easier, they want to make more revenue. Like we we all want these things, but a vast majority of us don't know how to get there. And so the shifts and the pivots and the growth that HubSpot has had over the past really even 12 months has made it accessible for everybody because all of these features that whether you knew you wanted it or you didn't, but all of these features that HubSpot now has, which 12 months ago and 24 months ago weren't available, it just makes it so that no matter really the size, the scale of your business, it's accessible. Now, if you are an enterprise business, you're going to use the enterprise hubs. If you're a small business, you might be on the free hubs. But those features that simply didn't exist and didn't give you the option to even consider HubSpot now make it so easy that you can just go into the platform. You don't need workarounds. You don't need a a, a tricky way to implement a solution it's just very easy to go in and do what you want or need to do yeah yeah no i mean you know i see i'm kind of i'm a, I, I get access to beta features and there's just every day it seems like there's a new little tweak that you know on the a surface if you just kind of see it you don't realize 
that it, there were hundreds, if not thousands of users who have been waiting for this little tweak to the way a field is connected or whatever that it like made, you know, their entire year has been made because of this. Um, and it's really fun to see people react to that. You see it in, you know, in the Sprocketeer community, which you all manage. I see it on LinkedIn. So as we wrap this up, and, and I really appreciate your time today, maybe you could, you know, between now and next September, and I'm sure it's very hard to, you know, no one can read the future. But as we, you know, let's say it's September, or late August 2024, and we're all getting ready to head up to Boston again. How do you think the HubSpot ecosystem will look then? Uh, compared to now, you know, what kind of changes do you think we'll we'll be seeing then? I think it's going to be more robust because at the end of the day, right now, again, there are a lot of features that people didn't, I, some people didn't even know they wanted, which have been released. Um, I left town for two and a half weeks. I come back and the amount of time I've spent reading on product updates uh, is just, it boggles my mind. So HubSpot's moving very, very rapidly. I think that this time next year when we're post inbound or, you know, just prior when we're getting ready to inbound, the biggest difference is going to be in the conversations that have been had around new ways to solve old problems. And it's not that it's novel ways, but it's um, new ways that are going to make our lives easier, uh, whether that's reporting, sales motions, marketing motions. There's just going to be so many more updates that, you know, when we're getting ready for inbound, it's going to be, hey, you know, how have you solved these problems, um, you know, and how have you solved these problems? So I think that we're going to have a lot of solutions that are just going to make our lives a lot easier uh, between now and, and inbound next year. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it's it kind of boggles my mind to imagine you know, what 12 months from now will look like compared to the last 12 months. Um, as we wrap up, uh, why don't you tell the folks at home where they can find you, where they can find Rev Partners, where they can find, you know, the Sprocketeer community um, so they can engage further. Yeah, for sure. So uh, my name is Cameron Collins. I'm all over LinkedIn. You can go searching for me on Instagram, uh, Facebook, maybe less exciting on there. Um, but I, I do post all kinds of fun stuff on LinkedIn, both revenue operations content, as well as skits and, and videos that are both informational and uh, some entertaining on other CRMs. Yeah, yes, I, I they're very entertaining. Uh, so definitely find me on LinkedIn, Cameron Collins. I work for Rev Partners. Uh, we work with uh, businesses and companies that are looking to grow and use revenue operations as a service. So um, whether you're brand new to RevOps or you're, uh, you've been using a single employee for a long time that you can work with rev partners and, and we'll provide revenue operations as a service. Um, I'm also a part of the Sprocketeer community. You can go ahead and type in Sprocketeer. I'm not going to spell it, uh, but we'll have it in the show notes, I'm sure. <laughs> but you can go ahead and type in Sprocketeer, um, pull up our website, download the Discord app, and it's a community. So it's the largest community for revenue operations professionals where we all get together and help each other out. So if you have questions, you can ask them. Um, if you are a RevOps pro, you can go ahead and show your expertise on there. And you'll see me on there super uh, frequently and active. Uh, my username is Super Rev Optics, yes. which comes about from one of my early skits that I created. Yes, those skits are very entertaining. You, I, I, you will also see me on there, and my hope is that I will get more of the folks that are active on there on this podcast and and interview them. So, Cameron, I really appreciate your time today. Uh, this was super uh, interesting, and uh, yeah, hopefully, you know, in twelve months, we'll be able to do a follow up interview. Yeah, definitely, we'll have some meetings and conversations between now and inbound next year, I'm sure. And then I'm very excited to see what we do post inbound 2024. Yeah. It's going to be wild.